It is good to see all of you this morning. If you're a visitor meeting with us for the very first time, then I encourage you to fill out a visitor's card. It can be found in a small rack in the pew in front of you. At the end of our worship service, a few of our members will come around with a basket and collect those up. If you have any questions about Monte Vista, if you have any questions about the Bible, or about religious things in general, then we'd love to sit down and open up our Bibles together and have that conversation with you. Now, I'd like to go ahead and increase my nerd credibility with you this morning, as if it is not apparent enough that I am a total nerd. I used to play the bassoon. Now, when I say I used to play the bassoon, I mean I was a pretty good bassoon player. But I can't play the bassoon anymore. I played the bassoon starting in middle school and all four years of high school. And yeah, I was even a music major in college and played the bassoon. I was a good enough bassoon player that I was featured in the Oregonian, which is the major newspaper there in Portland, Oregon. Yes, that is me, my senior year, bonding in the band. And our senior year, we won the state symphonic band competition for the third year in a row. But I don't play the bassoon anymore. Whatever happened to that? Whatever happened to that part of my life? Maybe you have a, uh, and, and I should really get rid of this, so let's just, there we go. I don't want you reading that article too closely. But maybe you have a hobby that was the same way, something that you did when you were younger that you were very passionate about, that was very exciting, very interesting, very engaging to you. But as you go through life and you have a career and you have kids and you get busy with other things, the number of hobbies you have that kind of gets reduced until you're finally just left with maybe one or two or even none, if that's the case with you. Whatever happened to that passion, though, that interest that you had in a hobby? Well, the same thing can happen to us spiritually. We start off in our Christian walk so zealous and excited about Christian, uh, Christianity, about Bible matters, about learning and growing. It's so interesting to us when we first begin, but something happens along the way where we lose that zeal and we fall into a routine or maybe a rut, and we're just not excited about it anymore. And we stop growing. But the thing is, if you stop growing, it's not just a matter of you kind of staying static, staying at a certain point. Well, I've stopped growing. I'm kind of fine where I am right now as a Christian. If you're not growing, you are, in fact, regressing. A failure to grow is really going to cause a failure to move forward at all, to even stay where you are. It's not like riding a bike. And I know you're familiar with the old adage of something's like riding a bike when you just pick it up after years and years and years of not doing it. And I, I'm not even 100% sure that riding a bike is like riding a bike. Sometimes if you haven't ridden a bike in a long time, it can be very difficult to get back into it. Your body has changed. Your fitness level has changed. Your familiarity has changed. Your knowledge has changed. Even riding a bike isn't always like riding a bike. So like ignoring any skill or hobby for a long time, our Christianity can also be lost, or if not lost, then at least made ineffective, brittle, or superficial, which means that it is lost. I loved Alan's lesson from last week. In his first lesson, the 9 a.m. lesson, he very expertly pointed out that being converted to Christ is about much more than just forgiveness. And he even said it in those exact words. It's about more than forgiveness. It's about transformation. It's about conversion. It's about changing who you are. Your lifestyle's changed. Your habits are altered. Your thinking is adjusted. You have new goals that are set for yourself. In short, when you become a Christian... You have to ask, have you really been converted? And then years on down the road, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, you have to ask, am I still being converted? Am I still changing and growing and learning and maturing? Or did I quit doing that somewhere along the way? Did I lose that passion somewhere along the way? And if you have, to any degree then the next question you have to ask is, how did I get myself to this point? How did I get myself to this point where I have a hard heart, 
where I have ineffective faith? How did I get to the point where I am just going through the motions? In other words, how did I lose my fire? How did I go from being so zealous and so excited to just being apathetic, indifferent, disconnected, uninterested? I think one of the answers is in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. So have your Bibles open here to Mark 4, and we will read the whole passage because I think it's worth seeing the way Jesus explains it in His own words. In Mark chapter 4, in verse 9, He has just finished telling the parable of the sower. And if you're not familiar with that, he says that there's a sower who goes out and he spreads seed on different kinds of soil. And in some of the soil, the seed grows up and other kinds of soil, it doesn't. In fact, most of the kinds of soil fail to produce anything useful. Now he begins here in verse 9, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And I want to emphasize that. He who has ears to hear, let him him here. And that's all of us, by the way. Even if you're deaf, you still have the ability in some way to receive the gospel. You still have that ability. So he's not literally saying if you have actual ears to hear the words coming out of my mouth. He's saying if you have any ability at all to receive the message I'm giving you, then receive it right now. We're without excuse. Now, as soon as he was alone, beginning in verse 10, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parable. And he was saying, To you it has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside, they get everything in parables. In order, and he quotes from Isaiah 6, and we'll look at this passage in a little while, in order that while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they return and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? And how will you understand all of the parables? If you don't get the parable of the sower, how can you understand any of the parables? The sower sows the word. The seed that's being thrown at is the word of God. It's the message of the gospel. And these are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, they, and immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. So that's one kind of soil. You throw the seed down, but immediately the birds come. Satan comes. He takes it away. You don't have a chance for it to take root. That's the person who has maybe heard the gospel, but just didn't penetrate. Didn't get very far with them. Falls on deaf ears. They're not really that interested. They'll listen. Maybe they're a little bit curious, but that's as far as it goes. In a similar way, verse 16, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky soil who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. They're very excited. This is an interesting thing that you're talking about. I love God. Love Jesus. Who wouldn't love all that stuff? Yeah, sure, I'll become a Christian. This is awesome. And they're excited about it at first. But they have no firm root in themselves. They're only temporary. When affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. As soon as it gets a little bit difficult, they lose. Now maybe going back to the whole idea of a bassoon, okay? Bassoon is a very difficult instrument. But there's something like 25 keys and holes on that thing. You only have 10 fingers to, to use at your disposal. It's a very difficult instrument to play. And some people might tr play it because it looks interesting. They're curious about it. They like to think, well, you know, there's only one bassoon in a band. Maybe I could be first chair after all. <laughs> I'm not saying that was entirely my motivation, but I started off playing the alto saxophone and there were like 20 of us. I thought, boy, I'm never going to get ahead with this group of people. <laughs> and then when the middle school band teacher said, well, we need someone to play the bassoon and no one raised their hand, I thought, first chair, right? No competition. This is awesome. But a lot of people might give it a try or any musical instrument or any hobby. It's not just bassoon. But as soon as it gets hard, as soon as they go from kind of that euphoric first stage of, hey, I'm doing a new thing. This is really neat. This is all brand new. And as soon as it comes down to, well, if you want to get any better, it's time to practice. It's time to actually put some effort in. It's time to get a little bit deeper with it. With any hobby, with any skill, you reach a point where it's not fun anymore and you've actually got to put some work in. Happens to our faith as well. 
But he goes on to say here in verse 18, And others are ones on whom seed is sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, and the worries of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in, and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And these people don't lose their faith because of persecution. They lose their faith because they just get distracted. They lose their faith because of entertainment. They lose their faith because something else glittery and shiny over here distracts them. That's why they lose their faith. So from this parable we learn you either don't seize onto your faith in the first place, or you fail to grow it properly, or you neglect it. And because of all three of those things, you might lose your faith and become unfruitful. And this is what Jesus has to say, by the way, to those who have become unfruitful. Go back to Mark chapter 4 and go a few verses on down to verse 24 and 25. Take care what you listen to. By your standard it shall be measured to you, and more shall be given you besides. For whoever has, to him shall more be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. I think there's a lot of ways that you can apply that. But speaking specifically to our faith question today, if you're unfruitful as a Christian, if you've lost interest, if you've become distracted, complacent, apathetic, indifferent, or you've faced some persecution and it started to get a little hard for you, if that is you and you have become unfruitful, watch out. Because even what you have will be taken away. Even what you have will be taken away. To me, this touches on the question of, well, once I've grown to a certain point, can I just be satisfied being there? Why do I have to keep growing? Why do I have to keep producing? I, I, mean, I feel like I know enough stuff from the Bible already. I've been a Christian for a few years now. I'm experienced. I've done everything. I, I feel like I'm good enough as a Christian. Mark chapter 4, 25 touches on that attitude that says, listen, if you're becoming unfruitful, if you're becoming indifferent, it's not just a matter of staying static and I'm just going to stay where I am in my faith. God will take away even what you have and give it to somebody else. Unfruitfulness breeds further unfruitfulness. Now keep in mind, if you become unfruitful, you will notice some things happening to you. You will notice that you are losing your engagement level. You will notice that you are losing your usefulness. And with all that being said, nobody is beyond absolute useless, usefulness. Everybody can be useful if they just start engaging more. And people who lack commitment will not be put to work because they can't be trusted with that work. I like Proverbs 25, verse 19. The writer of Proverbs has this to say, summing up the unsteady person. In Proverbs 25, verse 19, like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot is confidence in a faithless man in time of trouble. If you make yourself useless, you will be useless. So some signs to watch out for of you losing engagement, of losing your faith, of having what you have taken away from you. The first is this, you're having a hard time remembering big picture things here at Monte Vista. You're having a hard time remembering what we're studying in class every week. You're having a hard time remembering what our goals are, which is pretty difficult because they're right there. You're having a hard time remembering what all of our deacons do, or who even is a deacon. You're having a hard time who, remembering who your group leader is, and what the purpose of a group is, a work group that meets every Sunday. And if you're having a hard time remembering these things, watch out. Because you're on the edge of having what you have taken away. You're on the edge of disengaging. You're on the edge of losing, losing the faith that you even have now. But you're rarely asked to help in any way. You're rarely asked to help in any way. If you're rarely being asked to help in any way, and I don't mean just in, in public worship, I mean in any way, if you are rarely asked to help, watch out. Because you're losing it. You're losing it. What you have is being taken away from you. 
Now, I, it only takes a few times, by the way. It only takes a few times to, to forget about a worship assignment that you've been given where you won't be assigned anymore. It only takes a few times to prove that you're not trustworthy before people stop trusting you with things. It only takes a few times when you say, hey, you need that big piece of furniture moved or someone's moving into a house. I'll be there. It only takes a few times of you not being there before people quit asking you to be there. And if you're rarely being asked to help in any way, it is a sign that you have disengaged. <laughs> Or you have a growing sense of being out of place where when you look around at Monte Vista, there's a lot of faces you don't recognize, a lot of names you don't know, and you just kind of feel less and less like, like I belong here. And, and let me share something with you. This is just a practical observation. And I'll preface it by saying this. Just because someone sits in the back of the auditorium does not mean it's a sign or an indication of spiritual problems. Okay? You're all good. You're good back there. Okay? <laughs> That is not an indication by itself that there is a spiritual problem. You could be moving around the auditorium for a lot of reasons. Rebecca and I, for example, we try to move around every six months or so, and we moved to the back part of the auditorium because we wanted to get to know people back there a little bit better. Um, so you could move around for a lot of reasons, but with all of those valid reasons in mind, something that I've noticed over my life as a Christian is there's almost always a correlation between people who have fallen away and people who have moved steadily back and further back and further back and further back. Now again, I emphasize, I'm not saying that there has to always be a correlation. That, you know, sitting in the back is not an indication always of a spiritual problem, but I find there, there is often this link that the further back intentionally that you're going in the auditorium is that a sign that you're trying to distance yourself, that you're trying to disengage somehow, that you're trying to step back? And if you find yourself at a point at Monte Vista where you look around and you realize, I just don't know anybody here anymore, was that something that you did on purpose? Were you trying to disengage? And if you look around and you don't know anybody, watch out. What you have might be taken away. You're approached by a fellow church member who asks you, so, where are you visiting from? Watch out. Watch out. That's a sign to watch out for. Now, Jesus frequently uses the term, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus also frequently used the term dull of hearing. Have you become dull of hearing? Now, he frequently encountered people who had become dull of hearing. And the problem, of course, was not their ears, but their hard hearts. Throughout the Bible, Isaiah 6, 9, and 10 is quoted. Mark chapter 4, 12, like we already read, Matthew 13, 15, John 12 and verse 40. Even Paul the Apostle quotes it, speaking of the Roman Jews in Acts chapter 28, verses 26 and 27. It seems as if people, Jesus, His apostles, His disciples, people in the first century had this verse from Isaiah 6 on their minds. You hear, but you don't understand. You see but you're not really seeing lest you listen and hear and understand and know what's going on and acknowledge it and finally accept that you have failed spiritually and you turn from your wicked ways. And that verse is quoted so many times. Have we become that? Do you hear a sermon, but you don't listen to it? Do you read the Bible, but you don't understand it? Do you listen to an exhortation or even a rebuke from our elders who sit you down and say, we've noticed a pattern and it's very troubling. Oh, yeah, I know. I'll, I'll, I'll work on it. I, I know what you mean. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll work on it. But you don't really work on it. Then Isaiah 6 is your passage. That's your passage then. We make ourselves unable to understand. We make ourselves unable to even listen to the truth because of our hardness, our stubbornness, our distraction, and our worldliness. 
And Jesus said it best, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But how? And how have we become so deaf when our ears work perfectly? Well, take a look at the ground. And we know it very well here in the desert. It doesn't rain very often here, does it? Take a look at that parched, dry ground and the effect that the sun has on it. Now think about this. The very same sun can do very different things depending on what it's touching. To the ground, to the clay, the dirt, what does the sun do? The sun hardens it, dries it out. You look at that clay, and the clay, as the sun is exposed to it, the clay becomes harder, the clay becomes more indifferent. The moisture is sucked out of it. That's what the sun does to the clay. It hardens it. And yet the same sun that hardens clay makes life possible for a little sprout. You see the little sprout up there? Now the word is the same way, isn't it? We read about light in John chapter 1, for example. And I want to read that passage, by the way. If your Bible's open to John chapter 1. But we read about light in this passage and how Jesus is the light. His Word is the light. It enlightens people. It shines upon them. The same light that can grow Christians can also harden people's hearts if they're not willing to receive it. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, speaking here of the Word that became flesh, it says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness, the darkness doesn't comprehend it because when, when, when light shines on darkness, darkness goes like this. Darkness runs away. Darkness hides. Jesus even addressed this a couple pages later in John chapter 3 as He's talking to Nicodemus. He says down in John chapter 3 and verse 19, and this is the judgment that the light is coming to the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. The same light, right? It's the same light. And the, the same light that hardens people, the same light that offends people, the same light that sends people away, the same light that sends people into the warm embrace of sin and condemnation is the exact same light that welcomes people into the truly warm embrace of grace and forgiveness. The same light that enlightens some people darkens other people and makes them dull of hearing. So why can't I play the bassoon anymore? There are a lot of reasons why I can't play the bassoon. And when I say I can't, I mean I can't. It's not like riding a bike. All those keys and all those holes and all, all the factors... I could not pick up a bassoon and know how to make any note at all anymore. <laughs> Except to just lift all my fingers up and just let it go. I can't play the bassoon anymore. I've lost it. And there's a few reasons why I can't play the bassoon anymore. But there's one in particular that's at the core of it. Now, maybe I can't play the bassoon because of a lack of dexterity. And to a degree that's true. Though, that excuse only goes so far. Do I still have the same ten fingers? Yeah? Do I still have the same eyes? Sure. Physically speaking, if I wanted to, I could still play the bassoon. I have the physical ability, if I wanted to, to still play the bassoon. Now, maybe I don't play the bassoon because of a lack of resources. I don't own a bassoon anymore. I got rid of it a long time ago. But again, that excuse only goes so far because if I really wanted to, I suppose I've got the money. I could go buy a bassoon if I really wanted to. Okay, well, maybe I don't play the bassoon because of a lack of opportunity. Where would I play it, right? I mean, I'm a 34-year-old man. Where am I going to go play a bassoon? It, by myself at home? No, I... But, you know, even that excuse only goes so far because there are adult bands out there. If I wanted to, I could, 
I could take a community college course and join the community college band. If I really wanted to, there's opportunity. Oh, maybe it's a lack of commitment, right? It, I've got too many other things. I'm, I'm committed to other things. I'm busy in these other areas of life. I just don't have the time. Just a lack of commitment to it. Well, that's not the bassoon's fault. It's mine. Oh, a lack of practice. I haven't picked up a bassoon in... Well, let's see. I'm picking, I was 19 the last time I played. 15 years. Lack of practice. I, mean, I can't play the bassoon because I don't know how anymore. But you know, 15 years ago, YouTube didn't exist. And I suppose if I want to, I could, I could turn on a YouTube channel on how to play the bassoon. I could relearn it and pick it up pretty quickly, probably. You know, none of these excuses seem to satisfy None of these excuses seem to hold a lot of water. So what it really boils down to is I can't play the bassoon anymore because I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to play the bassoon. I didn't really want to play it all that much in high school anyway. But I don't want to. So why are you failing as a Christian right now? Why are you disengaged? Why? Why does it feel like Monte Vista is not home anymore to you? Why does it feel like you've lost the love, the zeal, the interest, the excitement? Why have you stopped growing and become static in your faith? Why do you not know new things, practice new things, take on new things, meet new people, engage with unbelievers and teach them the gospel? What happened to you that the seed has fallen on soil and it's no longer being received? Is it a lack of dexterity? Well, surely not. The gospel is accessible to all people. John chapter 1 says that the light enlightens all men. Anybody who wants the gospel can learn it, can know it, and can teach it. Is it a lack of resources? I hope not. And if you're making that excuse that it's a lack of resources, a lack of opportunities to have a Bible study, a lack of resources as far as Alan or me or our elders or other people teaching Bible classes? Is it a lack of resources when it comes to the Bible or material that's available to you? No, that doesn't hold any water. Lack of opportunity? Again, I just don't, I don't think you can honestly make that claim without turning red in the face and your nose going out about three feet. Is it a lack of commitment? Well, Okay, we're getting to the bottom of it now, aren't we? We're starting to see what's at the core of it, a lack of commitment. You know, that seed that fell among that soil where it got choked out, it, it, all the cares and the concerns and the distractions and the wealth and the riches, yeah, it had a lot of other things going on in life. That faith got choked out, though. Maybe the lack of commitment is just because your commitment is spread too thin like too little butter on a piece of toast. Lack of practice? Sure. Lack of practice. Lack of reading? Lack of praying? Lack of worshiping? But at the bottom of all of it is a lack of desire. And if you don't want to be a really strong Christian, if that's not a priority to you, you won't be. You won't be. Now, I don't play the bassoon anymore because I don't want to play the bassoon, and I don't think I'm a worse person for it. I think I'm doing just fine. Nobody is going to go to hell because they didn't feel like playing the bassoon anymore. But there will be a lot of people condemned because they didn't feel like being a strong Christian. And we've got to get past that. Now, if you're not a Christian here this morning, you really ought to be. If you're out of practice... If you've been out of practice for a while now and you need to get re-engaged, then do it now. If you're just now hearing the Word for the first time and you're not yet a Christian, then listen to the message of Mark 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you have any spiritual need at all that we can help you with, then let it be known by coming forward as we stand and sing.